Well, good morning, friends. Brave in the weather to make it out here because he is worthy of our praise and our efforts. Whether you're in here in person or joining us online at home, we're glad that you made the decision to join together in worship today. We invite you in that spirit. Stand up. Greet somebody near you in the name of Jesus today. Shudder and even bringing this up, but uh, this is our first NFL season with an earlier start time to our worship services. You're welcome. We praise. Lucky for you, we're going to go long today, and we're still going to miss kickoff because we're going to see what is worth more our King Jesus or football. We're going to put this to the test today. I hope you're ready. <laughs> I kid, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But as it says, Psalm 150 says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So if you have breath in your lungs today, we need to be turning that to praise, for he is worthy. Come on, let's lift this up together.
shall we fear? And today we're talking about God's work, our hands. And when we know the love of Christ, the all-consuming love and the power that we have in Christ, we are free to work and to love and do God's will here and out in this world. Ah. You hear me when I call, you are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Church, whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though trouble. Formed against you will stand. He says, 
when weapons are formed against you, they shall not stand. We take, we take a great promise in that. We hold on to that. In this world, we will have troubles. But take heart, for he has overcome the world, and he walks through that with us. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's pray out. Let's pray out. Yes, Lord. Our God of angel armies, you are for us, then who can be against us? Help us to walk in that reality, Holy Spirit. Bring that to our minds and our bodies and our hearts that we remember that the power that raised Christ is the power in us. Holy Spirit, come. We want to receive whatever you have for us today, Lord, that we can go out and do your will that is good and pleasing and perfect. We love you and all God's people said, amen. You can be seated. Good morning. Good morning, church. Um, welcome. My name is Vanessa Eli. I lead our communications team here at Good Shepherd. On behalf of our staff and our entire church, welcome. So glad that you're with us this morning. Um, if you are new, we want to get to know you. We have connect cards in the back of the seats. Um, so fill that out and let's get you plugged in. We are relationship builders here and we want um, to develop authentic, real community. And so you're part of that and we want you to be part of that. Um, another thing is uh, we have prayer cards in the back of our seats. Prayer is intentional at Good Shepherd, and we have a pretty incredible prayer team that looks over every single um, surrender and praise that gets lift up, lifted up on a weekly basis. And so when you submit prayers to us, there is, there is a covering um, of your church community um, involved in that. And so we encourage you to be a part of that and share what's, what's happening in your life with us. Um, today is a pretty exciting um, Sunday, and this week um, we're getting ready for a pretty significant time in our church. So this Sunday is called God's Work Our Hands. It's about how we are the hands and feet of Jesus, and what is that? call us to? How do we respond in that? A question that we're asking ourselves is, where is God calling me to, to serve and make a ministry impact? We are all called and equipped in many different ways to serve um, this world and to serve God's church. And so that is our focus, and um, ELSA churches from all around are joining us in that. So it's an exciting time this Sunday. Another exciting time is we are starting a series next Sunday called DNA. This has been something we have been praying over and for for a very long time. We have um, six people on our vision team who are going to be teaching on the outcomes that shape who we are and who, be who we become when we live into our identity in Christ. And so God pursuers, stronghold breakers, gift users, we're going through each one of those in a new and fresh way. And we believe this is going to breathe life into this church um, for where God is bringing us next. And so you have to be here. I am so excited. Um, and so I'm excited for us to get prepared for that this upcoming Sunday. Um, one of the, uh, another thing that's happening today is Coffee with Council. So it's going on right now. It's also happening after this service. It's downstairs in room five. We invite you to be a part of that. Council is going to recap where God has brought us since our last meeting together with Council, where God has worked in our ministry areas, the impact that has been happening, and where God is taking us next. So we invite every person to be a part of that. Um, it's downstairs in room five. Um, lastly, one of our outcomes in DNA is being a generous giver. We believe that generosity is just not this transactional thing, but it is a full response with our life. It's how we respond to God's um, love and compassion over us. I've been humbled and inspired by the ways that this congregation has shown up through their resources and finances in the past couple of months, even in the past couple of weeks, um, stories, being able just to see from like an overarching um, viewpoint is, is really incredible. And so um, as we enter into this moment of giving and our servers are coming up, I just ask you to take a moment, reflect on your journey of generosity and where God is calling you in this moment.
Good morning. Can you feel it slipping away? Summer, that is. A few more days left, hopefully a few more weeks, but I feel it slipping away. So let me be the first one here to say that Christmas is 105 days from today. Yes! Because next week you'll be hearing Christmas songs in Walgreens, and at least you could say, no, I heard about it in church first this year. The decorations are already up, see? Somebody beat me to it. So 105 days till Christmas and summer is ending. But I don't know about you, but I had a great summer. Got to hang out with some family and some friends and do different things and go and be in different places. I got to do some diving, got to hang out with my family. So when you think of summer and when you think of vacation and where you think of places that you've been over the last few months, what's a favorite place for you? Like, did you have a favorite place that you were this summer? And if this summer wasn't as great for you, somewhere in your life, where's a favorite place that if you could go there on vacation, you'd go? Ready, go. Share it with somebody next to you. I heard a few votes for Hawaii, a couple of votes for San Diego, I think I heard one Europe, and I heard a couple of people say, I'm staying home. God bless you, if that's your favorite place, there's nothing wrong with that. But if I said to you, those places that you've been that you think of fondly, that you have good memories of, you can probably remember what it looks like. You can close your eyes and go, yep, I remember what it looks like to fly in there, to drive in there, to be at that place. You can remember maybe what it smells like. You can remember some of your favorite smells, or you can remember what it sounds like. One of my favorite places to be on the planet is a dump in Hualan, Guatemala. Don't get me wrong, I love to be under the water in the South Pacific. Great place. I love to be at the beach anywhere warm. Yes, 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 yes. Yes to five star hotels and three Michelin star restaurants and all the stuff. Yes, yes, yes. But there's something about going to the dump at Walan, Guatemala, that transforms the way you think about God, the way you think about ministry, the way you think about life. And you know you're there first by the sights because you're on the bus with the rest of the short term missionaries. And you're driving in and you're driving through this hole in the wall forest in the tropical forest of Guatemala and you start to see trash on the sides of the roads. And the trash increases and and it just sooner or later it just turns into a mountain of trash. Because in the United States we have landfills. And landfills have liners underneath to protect you from the methane gas and the leachate. And after 20, 25 years we flatten it out, we put lots of dirt on top. And we build something else on top of it because that's a landfill and we cap it off. But in Central America, in Guatemala, it's not a landfill, it's a dump. And what that means is they found a hole in the forest and somebody with a pickup truck full of stuff that they didn't want anymore drove up to the hole in the forest, dropped the back door in the pickup truck, slammed it into drive and slammed the gas and went, and all the stuff went flying out the back. And you do that times 100,000 and then a few truckloads and pretty soon you have a dump. And if it's stuff that you're getting rid of and you live in Guatemala, you can believe that it's stuff that needs to be gotten rid of because they don't have as much stuff as we do here in the western suburbs. So driving into this dump, you start to see the trash. And that's the first thing, is the sights. And then the next thing that hits you as the windows are open is the smell. It's a At first, it's kind of a sweet, pungent smell. But then the sweet pungency turns into this sour, kind of burn the hairs off the inside of your nose smell. And it makes your eyes tear up. And you know you are at the dump. But it's not until you get off the bus and you take your dehydrated food and your T-shirts and your books and your toys and 
and the supplies and the medical supplies and all the things that you came there to bring the 600 families who live there. It's not until you get off the bus and you walk out into the middle of the dump and you're standing in front of this mountain of garbage and then you really know you're in the dump because all of a sudden you hear it and it goes and they start hitting your ears and your eyes and normally in places that have no CMs you don't see them. But when there are thousands of them clustered in little balls right in front of your face, you hear them and you see them and you kind of breathe them in. That's the dump at Wallan. And it's an amazing place to be because 600 families live there. So 1,500, 2,000, I don't know what the total number of people is and it's constantly changing. And if you're one of the people who are proud members of that cul-de-sac for years, you have pride of place real estate up at the top. And you get the best PVC. And you get the best scrap plastic. And the best quadruple wall corrugated to build your house out of. But if you're one of the newest move-ins to that subdivision, you get the real estate at the bottom of the dump. Trust me, there's no worse place as a human being, to live than at the bottom of a dump. When rainstorms like this come through Guatemala, which they do frequently, you don't want to be anywhere near the bottom. And so that's where we were on this particular day with a bunch of short-term missionaries from Good Shepherd and a few other churches, and we went to hold a VBS, and we went to offer some medicine and offer some food. And the first time I went there, I thought I was going there to be the good guy in Jesus' name and do really cool stuff. And we did do really cool stuff. But what surprised me, what shocked me to my core, is that when I got there, I found out that Jesus was already there. That God wasn't waiting for me to show up. Imagine that. God was not waiting for me to show up and be present in people's lives. God was already working. You could tell, you you drive by the church, and the church is a bunch of PVC pipes with some corrugated aluminum for a roof and a little stump for a pedestal. And that's where people sit, and I imagine there's a bunch of them sitting there right now doing church. And school is all the scrap notebooks that you can find and scrap pens and pencils, and you sit kind of on the side of the hill where the teachers come and teach you, and that's where the children go to school. And it's quite an amazing place. And I'm standing down at the bottom of this dump fighting off the new seams, and I got my big Canon camera. And if I would sell that camera, the proceeds from selling that camera would probably fund the lives of 10 families for a year. And I'm taking pictures, because that's what you do if you're a big gringo pastor standing at the bottom of the dump and will on. You take pictures so I can bring them back and show you this is what it's like to do ministry in these places. And all of a sudden, this little boy came running down the side of the mountain of garbage. And he had on a t-shirt, and it was kind of nasty looking with holes in it. And he had some weird looking cutoff shorts and two mismatched flip-flops. And he's running up to me laughing and pointing at my camera. And I looked at him, and I went, photo, photo? And he went. (laughs) And I took his picture. And I turned the camera around and I showed it to him and he went, Mama, Mama! And he went running up the side of the mountain and I thought, oh my gosh, what did I do? I just crossed some cultural line. The whole place is going to throw me in the dump. And his mother came running out of their penthouse at the top of the dump and she had on her best Abercrombie t-shirt and it was gray. And I guarantee you it was not gray when it was originally sold on a shelf somewhere in the western suburbs of Chicago. And she came running down the mountain. Gracias, senor, gracias. And then said a bunch of other things that I don't understand. And out of the folds of her gray Abercrombie t-shirt, she took out a Tootsie Roll, and she handed it to me. And I looked at that Tootsie Roll, and I realized that I was being thanked for caring for her son. And so I took the Tootsie Roll thinking, I'll put it in my pocket and it's never getting anywhere near my mouth. No way, because it had stuff kind of growing on it. And I said, gracias. And she went back up to the mountain 
And the little boy was beaming because he thought he had done something amazing for me, and he had, really. He touched my heart. And then he says, gringo. <laughs> and so I follow him, and he goes around the big main pile of garbage, and we go out into the back kind of be behind the hill that his house is on. And he points, and I see this dump, and it's, it's more garbage, and it's fresh garbage, and it's moving. And I thought, what is that garbage that's moving? What? Oh, that's vultures. Yeah, there's like 30 or 40 of them, and they're eating breakfast. You don't want to know what they were eating. Let's just say, don't bring your pets anywhere near the dump at Milan. And I began to get choked up because this is his living reality except that he was filled with joy and his little crucifix that he'd been wearing around his neck that surely came out of the dump somewhere was beaming and he looked at the moving trash vultures and he went like this take a photo so I did I took a bunch of pictures of the vultures and then he came and hugged my leg and ran away. And I stood there, weeping, realizing that I had been met by Jesus. And then I heard some more sound coming from up on a ledge. And it was a doctor that had come on the trip with some of these churches, an anesthesiologist from the western suburbs of Chicago, who's an atheist who doesn't really want anything to do with God or religion, but finds religious causes to go and bring his son, because he said, I want my son to learn about the way the world works. He grows up in the western suburbs, and he's got it made. Yep, true that. And so his son was on this trip and enjoyed serving people. And here's this guy standing there watching this whole thing take place with me and the mom and the little boy. And the doctor's crying. And he said, what just happened? He said, what in the just happened? And I said, what do you mean? He said, I, I don't understand that. That little boy and his mother were joyful. Where does that come from? I said, because the God you don't believe in has wired us all for community. We are literally, neuroscientists tell us that we are wired to connect. We are wired to serve. Our bodies are healthier when they're in community and when they're serving and when they're reaching out and when they're being good to other people. And that's true whether you live in the dump in Wuhan or in the greatest subdivision in Naperville. And what you saw is God's grace and me showing up and finding God's grace, not bringing it. Because God is here doing his work his way. And I just get to observe and he just walked away shaking his head. Friends, today we're just talking for this one day before we kick off our DNA series about God's work, our hands. And the truth is there's no one in this room that isn't called by the Lord Jesus Christ to be a minister of his gospel his goodness, his justice, his truth, his mercy, his kindness, his healing. You are called. And you're called whether you live in a dump in Wallon or whether you live here. Let me share a scripture with you from Matthew's Gospel, the 25th chapter, beginning at the 31st verse. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne... Before him will be gathered all the nations. That's all the political categories, all the ethnic groups, all the nationalities, all of them sitting right in front of Jesus Christ. And he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. You welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you came to visit me. I was in prison, and you came to be with me. 
Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or when did we see you naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer, I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it to me also. Then he will say to those on the other side, depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty. You didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger. You did not welcome me. I was naked. You didn't care. You didn't give me any clothes. I was sick. I was in prison. You never came to me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? And when did we not minister to you? Then Jesus will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Those are the words of Jesus. Those are the words of Jesus who says, if you go to the dump in Hualan or wherever it is that God calls you to serve, you will meet me because I'm already there. You want to find me? You want to live an authentic life with me at your side? Then go where I am, and I am in places where things are broken, where they don't work, where society has given labels and pushed people away. And that's the place I want you to be. I want you to turn off Fox News, and I want you to turn off CNN, and MSNBC, and CBS, and NBC, and PBS, and all the rest of them, because their labels don't work for me, God says. Here's my label. Everyone that you see is someone that needs to be ministered to. Drop your labels, drop your categories, drop your fences, drop your defenses. Stop protecting yourself. Stop limiting yourself and go where the world is broken. Go where people have fallen through the cracks. That is really powerful stuff, friends. The author of the book of James, a little bit later in the New Testament, says this in James chapter 2, verse 26. Faith without works is dead. Short verse, let's memorize it together. Ready? Let's just do it one more time with vim and vinegar just so we know we've got it. Ready? Okay, that's a simple spiritual logarithm. Faith without works is dead. That means if you say to me, Glenn, I believe in Jesus. See these six things I believe about him, but you have no works, then that means you have faith without works, and therefore you are dead. The Bible says that. And this passage from Jesus in Matthew gives us color and commentary and narrative on what that looks like. To be a person who says, I am a Christian, and I go to the best church, and I give, and I go to a small group, and it's kind of cool when I have time. But Jesus says, where are you showing up for the least of these? Where are you embodying my life? Where is your work showing the world that you love me? That is a really powerful thing. Let me give another, maybe better analogy. This week, world politics and power and authority shifted and changed in a weird kind of way. The queen died. Queen Elizabeth, like she served for over 70 years as Queen of England. She took the oath a couple of years after World War II. She's been queen longer than I've been alive, and I've been alive 64 years. That's a long run, friends. 
and it's powerful. And, and I got some tears in my eyes because I've seen her so many times as a kid and as a young adult and now as an adult. And I've seen her do some amazing things and live through some turmoil herself. And that she passed as an end of an era. But I listened to a lot of British news casters say, you know what, here's the conversation that's being had one more time. What is the point of the monarchy? I mean, she's symbolically good and she's wonderful and we love her and she's amazing and she brings together all the best of British culture, but she doesn't have any power and it costs a lot of money to put them in those castles. And the power really resides in parliament and prime minister. So what again is the point of the monarchy that hasn't had power for hundreds of years? What is the point? And unfortunately, there's an even more important political power issue because there are followers of Jesus that call him king, but he's king in name only. He's nice to have for cultural events. He's nice to have to say, yeah, King Jesus, you're all, except for not this area of my life, except for not my work, not my love life, not my marriage, not my parenting, not my retirement, not my investments, not my use of my time. All that's kind of, that. I'll, I'll take care of that, Jesus. You just take care of that one hour on Sunday morning, okay? Cool. And today we're talking about God's work, our hands. And this is true for me, too. I have to look in the mirror and go, Glenn, where are you just talking about it? Where are you not living it? And that's a truth for me. Because we are all called to be followers of Jesus and to embody his way of being in the world, to embody his way of thinking, his way of loving, his way of forgiving, his way of serving. Now, some of you are saying, you know what? The dump in Wallon Glen is as good a story as that was. I'm not going there. And I don't blame you. If you're not called to be there, don't go. You'll do more harm. That's okay. It turns out there's plenty of places for you to show up and serve. A few years ago, when my daughter still lived in Papua New Guinea, we were there with some missionaries who were Bible translators. And I always thought I knew what that meant. But on this particular day, a box came with New Testaments that they were going to take out to this tribe that had never had the New Testament translated in their language. And I was listening to this group of missionaries, a mom and a dad, and there were four or five kids, and they talked about how 16, 17 years before, they had gone out to this remote village. Now, let me explain to you what I mean by remote. I was sitting in a place called Goroka which took me four flights, 27 hours, wheels up in the air to get to. It's about as remote as I've ever been. And from that place, they were talking about going to a remote village, which meant that they got off the four planes, got on a helicopter, flew out over some more mountains, landed in another base, got in a raft, took that a few miles down the river, back into the bush to find a place where they could live with the tribe, build a hut to live in like the tribe. You got to understand when, when their children had medical issues, it's a day and a half medevac by helicopter to get them out. It takes a lot of faith. And they told me the story of how you translate the New Testament to a culture that doesn't have a written language. They have a verbal language. And so the missionaries have to spend time and listen and say, oh, that's the fourth time I've heard that word. When you're looking at that, that must mean house. And that's the tenth time I've heard that word describe that. That must mean water. And after 10 or 12 years of listening and putting that together and then coming up with some way of writing it down and then teaching the people, this is how we're writing the language that you've always been spoken for thousands of years and then sending that off to the scholars at Oxford and Harvard to translate it from the Greek and the Hebrew into this brand new language that they were creating and go back and forth and back and forth on that and live through years and years and years of danger and turmoil and challenge to get the word of God translated. And here's a box with brand new New Testaments. And they were so thrilled. And I was like, whoa. I mean, that's ministry that I don't understand. And I said, you guys, I am so humbled by your work. 
I, I couldn't do what you do. I could not move my whole family over here for almost 20 years, apart from everything I know in the United States. And the missionary looked at me and goes, what are you talking about? That's not your calling. That's my calling. He said, do you think I'd last more than about 24 hours back in Naperville? Are you kidding? Trying to tell a bunch of people that have nothing, who think they have something, that they need Jesus? He said, I would go crazy. <laughs> he said that, not me. I... And I thought, well, thank you for freeing me up to do what God has called me to do. What has God called you to do? I'm not looking in the eyes of any person in this room that doesn't have a calling. Maybe you're not called to go to a faraway South Pacific island. Maybe you're not called to go to the dump in Hualan. Maybe you're called to be here. Like one of my clients, a vice president of finance of a company, she'd been there five years doing really well, her compensation was somewhere around $200,000. She got a call from a recruiter saying there was another company that wanted her to be their CFO. It was her dream job. It was going to bump her salary by another 100000 plus benefits plus bonuses to the point where if they had a good year, she could make half a million dollars a year. I don't know about you, but I've never made that in a ministry year yet. And she said, I don't think I should go. And we prayed about it and talked about it. And she said, no, because I realized that if I go, the team that I've been leading for five years, who know I'm a follower of Jesus, are going to say, she just left for the money. And I can't do that. And I've got enough. Or another guy who owns a stock trading company. And he said, Glenn, I've never made less than a million dollars a year in the last 25 years. It doesn't matter if the market's going up or down. I know how to click the mouse on the trades, and either way, I'm going to find a way. He said, that's just how God has wired me. I don't know what else to do. So I'm going to quit that, and I'm going to go to seminary. I said, why would you quit that? Well, I'm not doing ministry. I said, what about the $700,000 you write to nonprofit organizations and mission organizations that enable hundreds of people to be fed and served and schools to be built? What about that mission? What about the boards that you sit on that you give good guidance and good strategy to? What about that? He said, well, I never thought about that as ministry. What about today we celebrate and remember 9-11 and everybody here remembers where you were and it was tragic. Over 3,000 people died. What was powerful and amazing was that the stories of people running into the buildings in the days after that. One of the first guys to be carried out of the building having lost his life was a priest, Michael, who ran into the buildings in Jesus' name. What about the Uber driver that I had just a couple of weeks ago? And he says, tell me your story. And I'm like, well, how long is the trip to the airport? 45 minutes. Okay, I can tell you the 45-minute version. Because I got about a five-hour version or a five-minute version, so we'll find the 40. And I'm telling him the story, and he goes, you're a Christian, aren't you? You're a follower of Jesus. I'm like, yeah, pastor. Pastor, oh, my goodness. I said, it's not that big a deal. It's just we're two guys. I did that for a while. He said, that's amazing. He starts telling me about all the conversations he gets in with dozens of people every day. He goes, Pastor, I don't know if this is right or if this is okay to say, but this Uber is holy ground. I said, bless you. And before I left, I prayed for him and prayed for his Uber because he's doing ministry in Jesus' name. What about my young brother, Nick Ranieri, who grew up in this church and then spent time in Honduras and and has spent time in missions, and now is a political staffer in Pennsylvania. I texted him this morning. I said, Nick, is it still possible for someone to follow Jesus and serve in politics and not sell their soul? And he said, absolutely. Stay grounded in your community. Stay grounded in a community that keeps you grounded in your faith. Reach across the aisle. Share power. And do it for the good of other people. And yes, you can serve in Jesus' name. Let me read a 
passage of scripture and then lead us in a moment of confession. How many of you believe that you should trust God? Okay, there's about 10% of you that are still working on that, and that's okay. If that's where you're at, work on it. How many of you believe that God should trust you? Whoa, the numbers have flipped. Let me read you a passage of scripture from the Apostle Paul, his second letter to the church at Corinth. If he writes a second letter, that means they didn't quite get it the first time. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. When Paul says, from now on, therefore, he's saying, hey, whatever happened back here, and I've got a past, I can't do anything about my past. My past is my past. I've done some dark, dangerous, evil, funky things. They're there. Jesus can come along and redeem those. And forgive those, but I can't do anything. So Paul is saying, therefore, in light of what you've heard about Jesus, turn. Make a new commitment from this day forward to serve in his name. Therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. He's saying, I no longer, now that I'm in Jesus, I no longer use the labels for all these other people that all my news channels tell me I should use. I just call them people. Sons and daughters of the Most High people that God loves, that Jesus died for. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we don't regard him that way any longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God is reconciling the world to himself, not counting our trespasses against us and trusting us with the message of reconciliation. God trusts you. God trusts me. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through you. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, you are ambassadors in Jesus Christ. You are called to a ministry that will not happen unless you show up with your personality, your DNA, your gifts, your challenges, your opportunities, and God is waiting for you to step into your calling and your ministry and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Is today the day? If today is not the day, what are you waiting for? If this is not the place, then where? If it's not with this community, then with whom? If it's not for Jesus then who will you serve? I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and take a minute. We'll call this a time of confession. Confession is simply saying, Lord, there's some stuff that's in my mind, my heart, my soul <laughs> that's in my way. Whatever it is, what is God whispering into your heart? What's in your way? Fear? Fear of serving? Fear of finding out? What's in your way? Your busy calendar? What's in your way? Maybe some guilt? Maybe some shame? Maybe, maybe you're hearing a story in your head, I am not worthy, I can't possibly serve because I'm such a terrible person. Whatever story it is that's getting between you and the story that God wants for you, today's the day to simply lay it down and say, Lord God, remove this. I confess that I need you to change me, to transform me so I can step into your power and your grace. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you in a moment of corporate and individual confession. I don't know what everyone's individual story is, but I know what mine is. And sometimes my busyness gets in the way. Sometimes my doubt gets in the way. Sometimes my frustration at the church gets in the way. Sometimes I get sidetracked by arguments that don't matter, by things that distract. Lord, help us all to lay it down 
Thank you, Jesus, for the forgiveness that comes in your name by your work for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So we're going to start with the ministry of reconciliation by practicing it in an easy place. Everybody gets to stand up, and I want you to find somebody that maybe you don't know, and walk, you can walk across the church. It'll be a little messy. And say, the peace of Jesus be with you. The peace of Jesus be with you. Go find somebody. Do it. Make it messy. I imagine that first communion table was messy because they'd come from some messy ministry. Jerusalem was in turmoil. And in the midst of that, the peace of Christ was present and felt. Jesus took bread, the bread of the Passover, and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. For you. Take and eat, all of you. After supper, he took a cup and said, this cup is my blood shed for you. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, know that I have laid down my life for you so that you can offer your life for others. By the power of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, you are healed, you are called and now you're ready to be fed. Would you pray with me the prayer that Jesus taught us? Our Father, trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For his kingdom, power, I want to invite our servers to come on up. We'll have several stations kind of in the middle and up here in front. And as you come, you can take uh, the bread and dip it in one of the two cups. Light colored is grape juice, dark colored is wine, whichever is your preference. If you'd prefer to stay seated, we have self-serving communion uh, cups available for you, whichever way is best for you. All are welcome at the table of Jesus Christ. He calls us all. Come as you are ready.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bless you, keep you, strengthen you in his peace. Brothers and sisters, go ahead and stand with me as we continue to worship. And may this song be a prayer as we head out into the world as we are God's hands and feet. Um, that we would enter a season of healing and strength and transformation in his name. Can I get an amen? Amen.
this is what God has done. This is what God is doing. It's what God will do. If we believe that he's done it before, come on, step out of faith. We believe he's going to do it again. Here we go. May the Lord bless you with mountains that are so big they can't be moved unless you humble yourself and say, Lord God, I need you. May the Lord keep you in places that are unsafe, but are places he calls you to be with his grace, with his power, with his truth. May the Lord God Almighty walk in your life with his peace with his grace, with his strength, with his joy, with his mercy, with his goodness, so that you are transformed into an agent of his grace. God's work, our hands. In Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said, see you next week, friends.